Finally, under the third requirement for misrepresentation, let's have a look at the case of Northumberland District Banking ex parte big. A shareholder had bought some shares and afterwards the company turned out not to be doing very well. The shareholder then found out that the company had issued some false reports in the past. The question arose whether the buyer had been misled by those reports, which then induced him to buy the shares, or whether he only found out about these reports after he had bought the shares. The court held that he'd only known about these reports after he'd already bought the shares. So it was not these reports that induced him to buy the shares in the first place. Hence, the third requirement for inducement was not met. Let's move on and look at the types of misrepresentation there are. There's basically three types of misrepresentation. Fraudulent, negligent, or innocent. Prior to 1963, there was only fraudulent or non-fraudulent. What happened in 1963 was the case of Hedley Byrne, which we'll come back to in a few moments. Another important milestone in the law of misrepresentation was the 1967 Misrepresentation Act in the UK. There's a conflict between what happened in 1963, the case of Hedley Byrne, and the 1967 Misrepresentation Act. Basically, what happened was that both the common law felt that there was a need to fill a gap between fraudulent and non-fraudulent misrepresentation, and legislators felt the same way, in particular because of a 1962 Law Reform Commission report, which then resulted in the 1967 Act. The problem, of course, was that between the Law Reform Commission report and the actual adoption of the Act, some years passed, and during those years, the case of Hedley Byrne had created a new type of misrepresentation, negligent misrepresentation. So we could say that the common law in this instance developed to fill its own gap and that it might not have been necessary for the 1967 Act to have been adopted in the first place. Let's now have a closer look at those three types of misrepresentation. First, there's fraudulent misrepresentation. This means that a false statement was made which the representer knew to be false at the time that the representer made that statement or at the very least had no belief in its truth or was reckless in the sense that he or she simply didn't care whether it was true or false. And the authority we can use here is Derry and Peak. What happened in Derry and Peak was that there was a tramways company that had issued a brochure detailing how it had the license to run steam tramways. In fact, it did not have such a license. But it did believe that it was going to get such a license at any time soon. Shareholders then claimed misrepresentation because they felt that the tramways had advertised that they had such a license, when in fact they did not have such a license. The court found that since the tramways company believed it was going to get such a license, there was no fraudulent misrepresentation. But this of course means that, at least by way of obiter, the court had confirmed that there might be such a thing as fraudulent misrepresentation if and where the representor makes a false statement knowing it to be false or at the very least doesn't care whether it's true or false. Negligent misrepresentation occurs where someone makes a statement that they believe to be true, but they don't really have any reasonable grounds for that belief. In other words, they are negligent as to whether the statement is true or not, even though they do believe it is true. This category of misrepresentation was essentially created in the case of Hedley Byrne and Heller. We recall this case from tort law. It was essentially about a statement given by a bank as to the creditworthiness of a company. The statement turned out to be untrue. However, it was given with the express proviso that the bank would not assume any liability for the correctness of its statement. So because of this proviso, the bank did not in fact incur any liability. However, again, in Orbiter, the court held that had it not been for this proviso, the bank would have been found liable for the negligent 
statement it made as to the creditworthiness of this other party. While there was no contract in Hedley Burn between the bank that made the statement and the other side who was receiving the statement, the concept of negligent misrepresentation had in fact found its way into the law of contract. And Esso Petroleum and Marden, in particular Lord Denning's judgment, shows this very clearly. Recall that in Marden, a statement had been made by an employee of Esso regarding the turnover or regarding the sale of petrol, the amount of petrol that was being sold or would be sold by a petrol station. And Marden, relying on this statement, took over the petrol station. It turned out that the petrol station didn't sell nearly as much petrol as had been stated earlier. Now, earlier we discussed this as a case of potential opinion versus a statement. And we saw that the court held that because the person who had made the statement was an expert and who was knowledgeable, this was in fact a statement for the purposes of the law of misrepresentation and not merely stating an opinion. Now we ask what type of misrepresentation was it? And so we find that it was a negligent misrepresentation. That is because the employee of ESO who had made that statement actually believed it to be true, but they did not have any reasonable grounds for that belief. The third category of misrepresentation is innocent misrepresentation. This happens where someone makes a statement which turns out not to be true, but at the time they made the statement, they believed it to be true, and they also had reasonable grounds to believe that it was true. So let's try and illustrate this by looking at the example of someone who bought a car. So A sells their car to B. A tells B that the car is five years old. B buys the car. B is very happy with the car. B drives the car. And after a while, B decides he wants to buy another car. So he's going to sell his car that he had bought from A. And so he finds a new buyer, C. So B tells C exactly what A had told B, namely that the car is five years old. B believes that to be true. B has reasonable grounds to believe that it is true. However, it's still a misrepresentation because B told C the car was five years old, and in fact, it is older. What type of misrepresentation is it? Well, it's an innocent misrepresentation. Why does it matter what type of misrepresentation it is? Well, it matters because of the available remedies. The remedies vary depending on what type of misrepresentation is involved. Generally, there are two types of remedies, rescission or damages. Rescission means that the parties are put back in their pre-contractual position. Damages is an award of money to be paid to a person as a compensation for their loss. The types of damages that are awardable for misrepresentation depend on whether it was fraudulent or negligent. Generally, in cases of fraudulent misrepresentation, both rescission and damages are available. And authority for that is East and Maurer. That was the hair salon case. Maurer was selling his hair salon to East. He told East that he had no intention of setting up a new hair salon. This was untrue. He knew it to be untrue. It was a fraudulent misrepresentation. East was able to recover not only for the actual loss, but also for consequential loss. Where negligent misrepresentation is concerned, again, both rescission and damages are available. However, note that sometimes the court can da order damages in lieu of rescission. We have to note when we speak about negligent misrepresentation that there are two main differences whether we bring our case under the common law or whether we bring our case under the 1967 Misrepresentation Act or similar acts where they may exist. The first difference is that if you bring a case under the Act, the burden of proof has been reversed. This means that whoever made the representation has to show that they had reasonable grounds for believing 
their representation to be true. If you bring a negligent misrepresentation case under the common law, the burden of proof is the normal burden of proof whereby the plaintiff has to show that the defendant had no reasonable grounds for believing the statement to be true. The other difference relates to the types of damages which are available. If you sue based on the 1967 Act, the damages which are available mirror the ones that are available for fraudulent misrepresentation. This means that they are tortious damages and may comprise actual damages as well as consequential loss. Where a claim is brought under common law negligent misrepresentation, the damages available would usually be assessed on normal contractual principles. In cases of innocent misrepresentation, Section 2.2 of the Misrepresentation Act 1967 sets out that a claimant can only claim rescission or damages, not both. Again, the court has the power to order damages in lieu of rescission. Damages are again assessed on normal contractual principles. Finally, let's have a look at some exceptional circumstances that may bar rescission and damages. First, let's have a look at Leaf and International Galleries, which is both a misrepresentation case and a mistake case. Let's look at it from a misrepresentation point of view for a moment. Leaf had bought a painting, believing it to be a constable. Five years later, he tried to sell the painting and was told that it was not, in fact, a constable. He tried to claim rescission. However, Lord Denning found that too much time had passed to be able to claim rescission even if there had been a misrepresentation on the part of international galleries with respect to whether the painting was or was not a constable. So, in the eyes of the law, the five years that passed between the original statement having been made, that is if it was made, and the claim for rescission being brought was too long. Put another way, we learn that if you want to bring a claim for misrepresentation, you can't leave it too long from the time that the statement was made to the time when you bring your claim. A second scenario involves efforts made to rescind. In Carr and Universal Finance and Caldwell, Mr. Caldwell had sold his car to a crook who had given him a false check. As soon as Mr. Caldwell was aware of this, he notified the police of what had happened. The crook subsequently sold the car to an innocent third party. The question arose whether Mr. Caldwell had validly rescinded the contract, this means the contract between Caldwell and the crook, before the car was sold on to the innocent third party. This matters because it tells us whether the subsequent contract, that means the one between the crook and the innocent third party, is valid or not. The court held that since Mr. Caldwell had informed police he had made every effort to rescind. Obviously he couldn't contact the crook to rescind so going to the police was the second best thing and the court held that this was valid rescission. Hence the contract between Caldwell and the crook was rescinded and the contract between the crook and the innocent third party was invalidated therefore Mr. Caldwell got his car back. In Long and Lloyd, Mr. Long bought a truck from Mr. Lloyd and the truck was meant to be in exceptional condition, that is according to Mr. Lloyd. Soon after, Mr. Long found that it was not in good condition at all and it had a lot of problems, including a broken dynamo. Mr. Lloyd offered to fix the dynamo and share the costs with Mr. Long. Mr. Long agreed. After the repairs, Mr. Long took back the truck and again it broke. The question arose whether at this point Long could still rescind the contract. The court held that because Long and Lloyd had made this arrangement to get the truck fixed, which came after the original contract to buy the truck, that meant the contract had been affirmed. Once you've affirmed the contract, usually by some sort of second subsequent transaction, you cannot rescind it.